1989, I had the privilege of going to what was Czechoslovakia to train up some young people. I was asked to do a youth camp. Now, 1989 was just after the Berlin Wall had fallen. So up until that point, Czechoslovakia had lived under a communist regime, but they had just received new freedoms and they wanted me to teach them how to plant churches in this new freedom. The person in charge was a buoyant, enthusiastic, joyful man who'd been in the ministry for years under this really, really difficult regime. And although he was rejoicing all the time, I discovered that he had spent much of his ministry in jail for his faith and being tortured for his faith. So I asked him during the course of this week, how on earth did he survive? How did he bear these difficulties and this suffering? And how did he maintain this spirit of joy that he had. And he sat me down to teach me some lessons about life. And he said, what I used to do was that when the torturers would come in to beat me, I would ask God to give me words of knowledge about their family. And then he said, I, as they came in to beat me, I would say, your cousin, has got this condition, or your mother has got this problem, so what I'm gonna do, I'm going to pray for your cousin, I'm going to pray for your mother. And he said it didn't necessarily stop the beating, but it sure made an impression on the torturers. <laughs> and it maintained his focus on Jesus. That man reminded me of Paul the Apostle because Paul had to learn to rejoice in tough circumstances. In fact, when he went to Philippi, the Bible says that he was put in prison for his faith, like my friend. And it says in Acts 16, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Here was Paul having been beaten for his faith, imprisoned, in chains, at midnight, rejoicing. And as you know from the story, an earthquake shook the prison, all the prisoners were released, and the jailer rushed in and asked, what must I do to be saved? So he also did what my friend did, because a number of years later, he wrote the book of Philippians and shared some of the secrets of his life. Philippians chapter four and verse 12, he writes to the Philippians a number of years later, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. I want to unpack that idea throughout this message. And if you want a title to this message, it's called Secrets of Strength. He was a man in Czechoslovakia teaching me his secrets of strength. And here is Paul in the book of Philippians teaching us the secrets of strength. Incidentally, that took place in Czechoslovakia in 1989. And I'd forgotten all about it until a few weeks ago in our college, one of our students walked up to me and said, do you know this man? And he showed me a picture of his pastor who had actually just passed away a few days previously. 
And there was a picture of his pastor and me laying hands on him in 1989, imparting faith into him to go and plant churches in his new situation. And all these years later, here am I teaching one of his pastor, uh, pastoral team. So how cool is that? If you do the right thing, it will bear fruit if you do not give up. All right, let's just quickly give you a bit of a background. Philippi, Paul goes to Philippi, having been preaching in Asia Minor. He's told in a vision to go to Macedonia and he starts in Philippi and he plants a church. It is the first church in Europe. So it is a highly significant church, an entree, if you will, into a new continent, an entree into the world of Gentiles and therefore highly significant for you and I. We don't know exactly when he wrote the letter to the Philippians, but it was several years later when he was again in prison. Many people think that he was in Rome in house arrest, and he writes this letter to the Philippians several years later to thank them because even though he's gone on to other things, the Philippian church had given him a gift, had sent him a gift while he's in prison to look after him. So basically the book of Philippians is a thank you letter to the Philippians. Thank you for looking after me in prison. I appreciate it. But the theme of the epistle is joy. Joy. 16 times joy in some form, either in noun form or verb form, is mentioned. It is all about rejoicing. In fact, one commentator uh, in Latin entitled this letter, Gaudio Gaudite, which means basically, I rejoice, now you rejoice. That really is the theme of the letter. I have learned to rejoice in difficult situations, now I want you to rejoice in difficult situations. I've learned what it is to be content, now I want you to learn what it is to be content. I've learned how to be in prison and stay rejoicing and have words of knowledge for my jailer. Now I want you to rejoice in prison. I rejoice, therefore you rejoice. Here it is, Philippians 1.18. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached because people were preaching inappropriately. And he says, because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Here he is saying, I've learned in the worst situations to rejoice, and I'm gonna to continue to rejoice. And then in verse uh, chapter four, verse four, rejoice in the Lord always, and just in case you haven't got it, again, I say, rejoice. In God's presence, there is fullness of joy, and God is here, so this is a place of joy. God is in prison, so it's a place of joy. God is in your difficulties, so it's a place of joy. God is in your triumphs, so it's a place of joy. God is in your provision, it's a place of joy. Rejoice, He said, I have learned to rejoice. And that's what I'd like you to do. So he's basically saying, um, I have learned this, but not all of the lessons have been easy. So I'm gonna give you some tough lessons first and then some concluding lessons. This is the secrets of strength. Are you with me? In Philippians 4 verse 12, he says this, and we've read it already. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. That word secret is a really interesting word in the original 
Greek language. It is only used once in the whole of the New Testament, and that is where it is used. And it is an, a pagan word for what is used in rites of passage or initiation ceremonies. You know, when someone, a young teenager in some indigenous tribes has a tooth knocked out or a, a tribal person has to go out and attack an animal with a spear or in, uh, if you're living in Pentecost Island, you've got to jump off a high tower. Rites of passage. He uses this word. In other words, I have learned through challenge. I have learned through difficulty. I have learned through testing what it is to be content. Are you with me? It's not just the good stuff that teaches us to rejoice. It's the bad stuff that sometimes teaches us to rejoice. And Paul had to learn. And here he is in the book of Philippians saying, hey guys, I want you to learn what I've learned. I want you to rejoice as I've learned to rejoice. So I'm gonna tell you the five tests that I've had to go through. Is that okay? Now, uh, Richard Raw, a well-known uh, Christian writer, has written a book on initiation, on rites of passage. And he talked about the five lessons of the rites of passage. And I'm gonna use these five lessons of the rites of passage, and I'm going to show you that Paul had to learn these five things. And if you and I are gonna be joy-filled people, even when we're being tortured, we've gotta learn these five things. You might not like them, but hey, tough. <laughs> All right, this is what Richard Raw says. The entire process that we will call initiation somehow made it possible for a man to experience these five essential truths. They became the five essential messages of initiation. Life, here you go. This is gonna encourage you on a Sunday morning. Life is hard. You are not that important. Your life is not about you. You are not in control and you're going to die. All right. Those are the five. I realized when I read this, I thought that's what I've been trying to tell my student for the last 30 years and they just don't get it. Uh, so I thought I'd tell you this morning and see if you all get it together. All right, so is this true? And are these the test that Paul learned? I think these are exactly the lessons he learned. So number one, Paul faced the fact that his life was difficult. Philippians 1.29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. So he's saying suffering is part of the Christian world. Get used to the idea. If you're going through a tough time, that's part of the, part of the plan. He goes on in Philippians 3.10 to talk about sharing in the fellowship of sufferings, participation in Christ's sufferings. So the first lesson of transition, the first lesson of maturity, the first lesson of growing up is that sometimes life is hard. Face the fact. You know, in Romans 4.13, Abraham, the Bible says, face the fact that his body was as good as dead, but against all hope, in hope, believed that God had the power to do what He promised to give him a child. In other words, if you want to experience a miracle, you've got to face the facts first and then believe God. So I'm looking at the facts. The fact is that life sometimes is hard. We want everything to be comfortable, don't we? It's interesting that the word comfortable has changed its meaning over the last 200 years. 200 years ago, the word comfortable meant the ability to be comforted. Whereas now, it means a nice chair in front of the television. But 200 years ago, the idea was better. You're gonna go through a tough times, but you have the ability to be comforted by God. That's what the word comfortable means. All right, Paul faced the fact that life was difficult. Number two, he faced the fact that he wasn't as important as he thought. 
I keep telling the students this, they don't get it, but hey, what do you do? Philippians 3.8, what is more, I consider everything a loss. In because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things, I consider them garbage that I might find Christ. He, he looked at all the things that made him look good. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I was of the tribe of, of Benjamin. I, as regards legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. I've, I've got all of these going, all these things going for me. I'm important. I've got status in the community, but I count this rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. I'm not really that important in the scheme of things. When you're in prison and being tortured, it, it gives you perspective, doesn't it? Maybe I'm not as important as I thought. All right, that's what Paul uh, not only learned, but wants you to share with the Philippians. Guys, I've learned the secret of being content. And I want to teach you this secret. All right, number three, still with me? Paul faced the fact that his life was not about him. Oh, great. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. We live in a world that's all about me. All about me. In fact, I read a book recently. Uh, it's a great little book called Being the Bad Guys. And uh, it's basically saying that 20 years ago, Christians were the good guys. Now we're the bad guys. And this is what it says. Our progressive culture seeks the kingdom without the king. The ambition is to replicate the kingdom vision of the good life, a future world of human rights, dignity, freedom, love, and equality, all without Jesus at the center. Yet while the king has been removed from the kingdom program, the throne has not been vacated. It has been usurped. Who by? Me, you. The individual is now enthroned in this new kingdom. That's why we're the bad guys, because we've just been singing, Jesus is in the center. And everybody is around us is saying, no, I'm in the center. No, you're not. Paul had to discover that not only was life difficult, but not only uh, was he not as important as he thought, he wasn't the center of the universe. In other words, he was indispensable. When you're in prison, God can't use you, or maybe he can. Are you with me? Number four, I better do these quickly because you may just get depressed after a bit. Number four, he faced the fact that he was not in control. Don't we love to be in control? We think we are the captain of our own soul. We are the masters of our destiny. But you don't have to learn, uh, live too long to realize you're not in control at all. That's what Paul was establishing. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence now, much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We don't preach much on that text. For it is God who works in you to will and to act, listen to this, in order to fulfill His purpose. I, I don't know about you, but uh, I've been thinking a lot about Paul on the Damascus Road. Jesus appears to him. Jesus converts him. Jesus changes him. We get excited about that. He's changed from one man to a new man. He's born again. It's salvation. Brilliant. And then he blinds him. And then he sends him to Ananias and says, I want you to go to Ananias and find out what you have been assigned to do. And I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Did Saul get a choice in any of this? Did he do a strength finder test <laughs> and work out what he was good at? Did he say, no, I really want to do this? No, he had absolutely no choice in the matter whatsoever. Jesus stops him. 
And this is the key. Jesus said, he, he said to Jesus, who are you? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And Paul's next response was, what do you want me to do? If you want to know what to do in life, you've got to first get a revelation of Jesus. You ask the question, who are you? When he says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, then you say, what do you want me to do? No choice, no strength finders, no personality test. Just go and do it, and you're going to suffer for it. Oh, great. So that's what he's trying to teach the Philippian church. This, remember I said, this is about joy. So you never connected the two. You thought, no, let's leave out all these verses and just go to the joy verses. No, number five, and finally, in this little test, before we get on to the good stuff. Paul faced the fact that life was going to end. He's going to die. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the, this body, this will mean a fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Here he is in prison writing, I may well die tomorrow. I may well, uh, be, they may well torture me, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with Jesus. How cool is that? We've forgotten how brilliant death is. We make a big deal about it. Oh, I want to live as long as possible because I want to avoid going to heaven to be with Jesus, <laughs> which is our ultimate goal. The Victorians talked about death all the time and I think we've, we need to start talking about it a little more. If we focus on death or beyond death, we're going to enjoy life a bit better. We're going to die. I didn't think I was going to die when I was 18. So I just did my own thing and then I got to midlife. And it's a midlife crisis. It's an initiation. It's a rite of passage. The first revelation I got, well, I got two big revelations at the age of 40. Number one, I've never achieved anything in my life. That's a shocking revelation. And the second thing, I'm going to die. I better make sure the next 40 years actually counts. So here's Paul in prison, writing back to the Philippians. You saw me rejoicing in Philippi. I've learned the secret of being content. So can I just share a few thoughts with you? First, you've got to face these five facts. Are you with me? But now I'm going to talk about some key ideas that are going to bring you joy. So in the last eight minutes of this message, I'm going to talk about some key ideas that are going to bring you joy. From, are you happy about this? All right. Number one, put your confidence in God. Joy is found in trust. A lot of people are talking about trust recently. I've lost trust. Can I suggest that if you really want joy, you've got to trust. The Bible says love trusts. And Jesus even trusts me with this message. Every time I get up to preach, he trusts me. I'm untrustworthy, but he chooses to trust, where, trust me because love trusts. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. Do you know what the word trust means in 1 Corinthians 13 where it says love trust? Do you know what it means? It means trust. <laughs> in the original Greek, it means trust. He trusts me. He trusted Peter just after he betrayed him. He trusts his disciples after they left him. He trusts me after I failed him. I've got to trust other people, but above everything else, I put my trust in God. I'm not going to trust the flesh. I'm going to trust God. That's what he said. Philippians 1.4, in all my prayers for all of you, I will always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. What God has started, he will finish. What he has planted in this church, he will bring to completion. 
what He has shared over years of preaching and prophecy, He will bring to fulfilment because He is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should change His mind. When He speaks, He acts. I put my confidence in Him and it's a gloriously happy place. The world is in a mess. I'm gonna die. I'm not as nice or as important as I thought, but I put my confidence in God. You getting the idea? Number two, be content with what you have. Joy is found in thanksgiving. I'm not saying this, Philippians 4.11, because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I've learned to be abound and I've learned to be abased. I have discovered over 70, nearly 70 years of living that when you have a lot of money in your bank account, it doesn't make you any more happy than when you have nothing in your bank account. Money is not the source of joy. God is the source of joy and I've had lots of money and I've had absolutely nothing and it makes no difference whatsoever. What I do is give thanks for what I've got. That's the key. Philippians 4, still with me? Don't be anxious about anything, including where your cash is gonna come from. But in every situation, even in prison, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, everybody say with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. Start, can I just a little challenge? Go around your house if you've got one and just thank God. Thank God for the bookshelf if you've got one. Thank God for the bed. Thank God for the television. Thank God for the child. Thank God for the dog. Thank God for the weather. Thank God for the lawn. Thank God for the lawnmower. Thank God for the helper. Thank God for the neighbor. By the time you've finished, you are gonna be filled with joy. Just thank God for what you've got. Put your confidence in God. Be content with what you have. Number three, share things in common. Joy is found in fellowship. That's a key word in this epistle. The Greek word is koinonia. It's a rich word. Here it is, Philippians 2.1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing koinonia in the Spirit, or in this one, Philippians 3.10, participation in His sufferings, koinonia, or this one, Philippians 1.4, partnership, koinonia, in the Gospel, verse five, partnership. In other words, I'm in partnership with you. We are in partnership together. Partnership in the gospel, partnership in the good times, partnership in the bad times. I need you, you need me. Church for me is not an option. 50 years ago, I decided to go to church. I didn't decide this morning. I've said this before, but it's so key. Fellowship is foundational. It's what joy is all about. My daily reading this morning from Psalm 122, I rejoiced because they said, let's go to the house of God. Why? Because I need this. This is a place of joy. I may come in feeling downhearted, but after listening to that choir and Jesse leading and all of you wonderful people, I am full of joy. Getting the idea? Everybody say, put your confidence in God. Be content with what you have. Share things in common. Number four, cooperate with others. Cooperate with others. Philippians 4.2, I plead with Udiah and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my size in the in the side, in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of, listen to this, co-workers whose names are in the book of life. I don't know who Clement is. I don't know who uh, Syntyche or Udiah are, but they've fallen out. And Paul says, don't fall out because joy is found in co-working. Don't 
start attacking each other. This is, the, this is the time to gather together and work together side by side with people. Co-working, the Greek word is syno, synergos, from which we get the English word synergy. Something happens when we work together. Conference, please, not only come, be involved, work together. You'll find joy because joy is found in involvement. Joy is found in fellowship. Joy is found in cooperation. Are you getting the idea? And then the final thing he teaches them, contribute what you have. Joy is found in giving. Philippians 4.18, I received full payment. Thank you for looking after me. I got more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, the gift you sent. They, your gift, are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. We've got a heart for the mission, a heart for the house offering coming up. Please be involved, share, because it's the source of immense joy. It's the source of joy. For years, I've given to the heart for the house and I've found joy. But can I just say, this isn't about just giving money. It's about giving the grace that we've just heard that we've received that you administer in the house. You've been given talent. You've been given abilities. You've been given skills. You've been given gifts. Come to church and bring them. Come early and bring your gifts. If I wasn't doing this, Number four, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be shaking hands at the door. I'd be putting out the leaflets. I'd be handing out the communion cups. I wouldn't be singing in the choir. I would, I would be doing what I have because that is how you rejoice. This isn't about entertainment. This isn't about uh, letting other people entertain you or bless you. This is about me being involved. Here is an old man writing in prison to his immature church saying, you've got to go through five tests and then I'm going to teach you five lessons. Rejoice, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. This is the secret of my contentment. And with that, I'm going to finish with this verse again. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then this final verse, I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Amen. That's a bit of a potted version of the book of Philippians. Hope it made sense. Hope you were blessed in Southwest and online in Shanghai and Launceston. As the team come up, can I just ask you this question? One of the reasons that Paul is able to talk so positively about such difficult circumstances is that he's met Jesus. He's met him. And once you've met Jesus, everything changes. Maybe you're in this auditorium or in the other auditoriums and you've never met Jesus. I mean, I'm not asking whether you go to church. Clearly you do. You may even know your Bible. But have you encountered Jesus Christ? He wants to meet you. And when he does, he wants to forgive you, change you, come into your life, turn your situation around. And here's the cool thing. And then give you purpose, give you a task, give you something to do through which you will find immense joy in life. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to include you in a prayer. So maybe everybody could just close your eyes in this auditorium and in the other auditoriums. If you've never given your life to Jesus, but you would like to, or you want to come back to Him because you've walked away, or want to just make sure that you're right with Him, I'd love to pray with you. And I need to know who you are. So while everybody's praying, why don't you just simply, where you are, put your hand in the air as a sign that you want me to pray for you. Include me in this, include you in this prayer and then I'm going to pray. So slip your hand up right now and I, let me pray. Thank you. Fantastic. Anyone else want to join these people? Thank you. Thank you. 
Maybe this is the first time you're doing it. Slip your hand in the air. Maybe you just want to come back to Jesus. Slip your hand in the air. Maybe you just want to make sure. Put your hand in the air. And I'm sure people are putting your hand in the air in Southwest, Launceston, Shanghai. Even online, you can put your hand in the air. All right, we're going to pray this prayer and I want everybody to pray it together, including you if you're on your own, in your room, watching online. Say with me, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, oh Lord Jesus Christ. I, realize today I realize today that I need you. That I need you. In your presence, in your presence. Is, fullness of joy. is fullness of joy. Please, Please. come into my life. Into Change, my life. Me. Change me. Do what you said you would. Do what you said you would. Forgive, me Forgive me of everything I've done wrong. From today, I choose, with your help, to follow you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Give these people a clap. So good. If you've just prayed that prayer in any of our campuses outside after the service, there will be someone holding one of these Bibles. Why don't you walk up and boldly say, I prayed that prayer. Even if you didn't put your hand in the air, say, I prayed that prayer. We would love to give you a gift from our church. And if you're online, why don't you put in the chat, I prayed that prayer. And one of our team will get in touch with you and help you to the best of our ability. Can I just encourage you this month, why don't you read the book of Philippians? Read the book of Philippians. Listen to Paul's secrets of strength. God bless you. God bless you.